So I'm uh, representing uh, uh, the Bangalore Biocluster, uh, that is uh, three institutions on the same campus, NCBS, INSTEM, and CCAMP. Uh, NCBS uh, works on uh, basic biology, and we study everything from molecules to the entire world in, in terms of ecosystems. We have a very wide range of, of interests, and as you'll see in a little bit, neuroscience is one of the key interests. INSTEM has a more translational and team-driven approach, so they can tackle big questions, and so the collaborative part is already built into how they operate, um, and as, I'll, sh I'll tell you a bit about that. And CCAMP uh, is, is like a technology core as well as our interface directly with industry. And the whole idea of having these as a cluster on a campus is to facilitate this, this transition from basic research and fundamental concepts in the field uh, on to uh, looking at uh, uh, how you, get, how you uh, implement them in the clinic or in other places, and then maybe even into uh, industrial uh, applications. And all of these have, are actually happening, so it's not just a, it's not just a, a wish list, it's something that, is in the, that we're in the process of implementing. Okay, so uh, very few words about NCBS. We have uh, six major, I would say, categorizations of what we do, though these are very flexible and people go back and forth between uh, divisions. For example, I'm both in neurosciences and in theory and computation. Um, biochemistry, biophysics, and bioinformatics, so this is protein structure and molecules, and on cell biology signaling, neuroscience, developmental biology and genetics, ecology, evolution, and theory and computation. We're now roughly in the 30, 35 range of uh, number of faculty. Um, and as I said, we uh, span uh, a whole range of uh, topics among these. I'll come back to this in a little bit more. I should add that we are celebrating our 25th happy birthday. Uh, it's, it's the 25th anniversary of the founding of NCBS, and there is a whole, a whole year-long year uh, series of events. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I saw some posters outside announcing Carl Desroth's uh, lecture, so Carl Desroth is one of the people who's going to be coming to NCBS. Uh, those of you who don't know the name Carl Desroth, he is one of the people who's been instrumental in developing the, the technology of optogenetics. Um, and this is, I mean, of course, with many, many other scientists around the world, but he has, let's say, been extremely high profile in this. And uh, this is, as I'll mention in a little bit, really been transformative in what you can do to study the brain. And I'll come back to that in a bit. Okay, so INSTEM has, again, got six themes. Um, uh, heart, uh, inflammation, tissue homeostasis, which is a complicated way of saying wound healing. Um, Center for Brain Disorders and Repair. I'll come back to this in a moment. Chemical biology and therapeutics. This is looking at ways that you can uh, tackle cancer. And in fact, the show Bank Thuraman, who, who uh, anchors this, has a close uh, collaboration right here with faculty at IIT Madras. Um, there's uh, regulation of cell fate. Uh, this is how cells decide whether or not they're going to live, die, or transform. And technologies for, for science. So all of these are, are uh, activities at INSTEM. And let me just uh, 
spend a little time talking about the activities at uh, CBDR, because these are a template, I think, for many kinds of uh, interactions we would like to encourage. So CBDR studies brain development, uh, brain de development especially, and uh, Fragile X in particular, though they have a, actually quite a wide palette of uh, disease models they do. And so Fragile X and other autism spectrum disorders are development uh, <coughs> disorders of the brain in which it's not actually quite clear. This is a, a spectrum. These are spectrum diseases. So it's not quite clear that all autisms are the same or the outcomes are of a particular mutation are all the same. So this is a complicated thing. Now, how do you study the physiology of brain cells in, in humans? Yeah? One approach is you make mouse models. You say, okay, I, like, I think this is the, 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 the gene that's at fault, and you knock it out in a mouse, and then you study the mouse. But, as you, sh you know, a mouse is not a human. You can't go out and catch your patient from the hospital and extract brain cells from them. But what you can do, and this is, this is actually a, a, an approach that is being done in collaboration with, uh, and is also applicable for other collaborations. What you can do is if you collaborate with a great uh, hospital such as NIMHANS, or, and there are quite a few others uh, who are also part of such efforts, you can work with patients whose medical history is beautifully worked out, whose family history is worked out, <coughs> So a lot of genetics is known, and you can take blood samples. Now, blood samples are not brain samples, but using stem cells, you can take cells from the blood, convert them into, into stem cells, convert those into neural stem cells, and now convert those into brain cells in a dish. So these are human cells with a specific disease, which you can study with all the techniques at your disposal. So this is the kind of thing that is being done at CBDR, and there's similar efforts, which I won't get into in so much detail, but uh, suffice it to say that we've, we've received extraordinarily generous uh, support, uh, or we're looking forward to extraordinarily generous support, and uh, this is something which we can apply in principle to other diseases as well. Okay, so these are, this is just an example of, and this is, a, I should stress, a very collaborative effort. It takes a huge amount of input, it involves medical, technical and basic neuroscience expertise, and all of this is something which we are uh, trying to link up. For example, um, in this case, the University of Edinburgh is also one of the key partners. Okay, let me move on. So, uh, CCAMP does a whole lot of technologies. I mean, here I think I'm listing uh, some seven, but I think they have some 25 or 26 different kinds of facilities that they run. They have supported activities for researchers all over the country, I think over 200 institutions around the country have used their, their facilities. And so if you need some kind of technology for your research, uh, and it's bio biotech-based, it's very likely that CCAMP supports it. Okay, uh, NCBS and the BioCluster in general have a huge number of engagements with the outside, and I swear to you, I did not make this slide especially for this talk. IATM was already there near the top. We have... <laughs> We have long-standing interactions, and uh, Anil Anantaswamy is not here right now, but he is, he's actually been spearheading and he spends a lot of time uh, at the BioCluster in Bangalore uh, working on, on crazy optics, and there are various other ties. Okay, so as you can see, we work, we work with a lot of people, and a lot of uh, very, very valuable uh, science has come out of these collaborations. Um, here, I'm not going to do any kind of justice to this, but these are all great people doing amazing stuff. Uh, 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 Mr. Spanaker looks at uh, mechaniz molecular mechanisms for uh, uh, disease, uh, mental disease. I work, I'll tell you a bit about what I do, computational neuroscience and systems biology and memory. Uh, Shona Chatterjee is, is the one who's also spearheading the CBDR effort on stem cell uh, uh, analysis of, uh, of disease. Uh, but he also studies learning and memory, and of course these things uh, relate very closely. Sanjay uh, works on physics and neurobiology of insect flight. So this is a, a marvelous example of a cross-disciplinary problem, right? You have aerodynamics in there, and you have uh, mechanics and material science in there, and you have neurobiology in there. Uh, Gethi Hassan works on, uh, on some of the signaling pathways. I'll be telling you about signaling pathways. They're crucial to brain function. I think all this business about electrical activity in the brain is grossly overstated. I'll come back to that. <laughs> Hold that thought. Okay, 
Watzlaw works on development uh, of the of, of movement itself. How does an organism start to move, and when it starts to move, how does it control it? Uh, Axel Brockman works on honeybees and how they f how they learn and figure out where to get things from. You know all this business about the waggle dance. You've, you've heard about that. Um, Shannon uh, works on chemical ecology, which is an amazing field. It is the basically how all of nature talks to itself, how, na how natural organisms talk to each other. And a lot of this goes through olfaction, through the sense of smell. Um, Hia Ghosh looks at neuroimmune interactions, the nervous system and its immune function. And uh, Raj Ladar, who's just joined, is studying the development and evolution of the sound system. I haven't mentioned the details of people working in theory. There's a strong theory group at NCBS, and there's some overlap. In fact, uh, I see Venkat sitting over there, so he's, he's part of the theory group there. And I haven't mentioned several of, the, uh, of our colleagues, who, uh, such as uh, Ravi, who's in, uh, in STEM. So this is just the NCBS uh, gang. OK, so uh, this is the bio cluster. And having, having uh, given you a pitch for the kinds of work we do, let me give you a somewhat more uh, theme-oriented pitch about the kind of work I like to do because I like to talk about my work. I'm sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to talk. But these are, these are absolutely, the reason I bring this up is that these topics are really, really fundamental, I think, to neuroscience, and a huge amount of collaboration and good science can come out of it. So, analysis of structure and hardware for neural circuits. This was one of the key topics that, I, that uh, this, this uh, collaborative center is about. <coughs> Let me tell you about two things. Readouts of activity in networks and how we control activity in networks. So, I'll start by telling you about the people. That's Ashesh, that's Mehrab, that's uh, Ananth, that's Shomo, Anshul, and Sahil. And they're, they're, they're all supposed to be wearing, he's, he's not in uniform, but they all, what they do is they steal my, my, my jacket. Yeah? They steal my jacket, and they all claim that I always waggle my eyebrows, so they're all trying to pose in that way. This is, anyways, they, they like to play tricks on me. So this is a microscope that principally Ashesh and then Mehrab built, and they built it. This is a two-photon microscope. It's called Bheja Fry for obvious reasons. How many of you know what that, what that implies? OK. So the point is, two photon lasers are very powerful. You put enough energy into a brain, what happens? OK. So they, they discovered what happens when you put enough infrared laser light into a brain, Bheja Fry. This is an optogenetic rig. You'll see these, these things in a moment. So the system that we study is the hippocampus. Uh, it's involved in memory formation, in how, how animals look, uh, find their way around the world. It gets inputs from pretty much all your senses. And if there's, got, there's lots of interesting network theory behind this. I will unfortunately have to skim over all of this in the interest of time. So here is Beja Fry, at least as a schematic. And that's an image, and I'm a little short on time, but uh, so I won't show you the details of this image. Um, what we do is we make a small hole in the, in the mouse's uh, head, and you're sort of seeing, seeing down, looking down from the viewpoint of the microscope, looking down on the mouse's head. This is not one of these uh, lovely non-invasive techniques, right? You can't do this from outside because we are going to go after single cells, yeah? I mean, there are other clever techniques, but this is the one that we use. Um, we make a small hole. In fact, unfortunately, there's this kind of unnecessary piece of the brain called the cortex, yeah? So it's in the, it's in the way, it's, in, it's just in the way, it's a roadblock. It's, the, it's in between the microscope and the hippocampus, which is what we're after. So we get rid of it. Uh, no, we make a small hole in it. Uh, this is the somatosensory cortex, and it isn't terribly important for, for this task. Um, so we image then this banana-shaped region called the hippocampus. And what you see here is uh, if we remove all other sources of light and just look at the fluorescence, the signal that comes out of it, that's a picture of what we see in the brain. But what we really see is something quite amazing. So now we get down to the resolution of what the two-photon can give us. Why a two-photon? A two-photon microscope allows you to image not just at the surface of the brain, but into the brain. Yeah? And we can, we can go about a half a millimeter or a bit more into the brain. What uh, Professor Mirgankasur there is doing is developing techniques to go a couple of, couple of millimeters into the brain, which is a couple of, you know, several cell depths really deep into the circuitry. Yeah? So, but this is amazing. That means that you have this functioning piece of brain, in fact, in an awake behaving animal which is learning something, and you can watch what the cells are doing. How is it that you can watch what the cells are doing? This green stuff isn't just some 
post facto colorization. It is a protein which is fluorescent. But not only is it fluorescent, its fluorescence increases in the presence of activity of the neuron. Right? It detects the entry of calcium, which happens when the neuron is active. And so it becomes brighter when the neuron is firing vigorously. And this is a completely amazing te technology that has been developed in the past few years um, so that you can genetically encode these proteins. So you can make their, their transgenic mice, which we use, which have these proteins. And so you just open it up and you shine a light and you can literally read out the activity of the brain. It's like watching the lights go blink, blink, blink on a computer in at least an old-fashioned computer of the kind that I started my, my PhD on. Well, not in my PhD, my, my undergraduate on. So you can literally watch the brain as it computes. And that's what we will use. So lots of massive image processing. Here we are recording from 155 cells. We're now clo uh, closing in on much larger numbers. The largest that I know of is over 10,000 neurons recorded simultaneously using this kind of approach. I don't know if there's, Mriganku, is the, is the record higher than that now? Over 10,000? Yeah, so that's, that's, now we're talking serious numbers. I mean, still very small compared to 10 to the 11, but it's a good number. So this is a, uh, just a raster of the activity of 155 neurons from this particular recording. What we can now do is we can now do this while an animal is learning something. Yeah, this is learning something really simple. It's learning that here comes a sound, and the sound is coming just before a puff of air to the eye. Yeah? This is classical Pavlovian conditioning. How many of you have heard of Pavlov? Yeah? Okay, you all know the, the bell and uh, saliva thing, right? So this is exactly the same kind of learning, or it's a very similar kind of learning, except instead of the bell, there's a sound from a speaker, and instead of the food, there's a puff of air to the eye, and so naturally the animal blinks, and it learns to blink when the sound comes. Okay, fine, so the animal learns this, we have various ways of reading out the activity and the behavior. And this is the, the amazing result. So here's the, here's the whole set of, in this case, 100 neurons. But when you sort them out, you find that the neurons, so brightness here indicates the level of activity. Uh, each line here is uh, a different neuron. And this is the presence of the sound. That is nothing, and that is the presence of the buffer there. Okay? And what you see here, is a sequence. It's almost like a relay. That is, when the sound first comes on, this set of neurons goes on. Then a little later, that set, that set, that set. It's like a relay race. They're passing the baton of activity to indicate that something happened there which has significance. It's related to a significant event coming later. So the animal only shows this kind of sequencing if and only if it learns. It does not show it if it has not been trained. It does not show it even if it has been trained and fails to learn. So this is a very interesting insight into the computations that the brain is doing. That is, this region of the brain is forming a sequence, a relay race, a relay chain of activity that spans two different stimuli which, uh, which are representative of, of, uh, uh, of this procedure. This is the same kind of data, only showing a bit more detail. So here's the traces before learning, and this is the traces after learning for three different cells. Yeah? So you can see that they form a nice uh, sequential wave of activity. Uh, just another, I find this very interesting. My students say this is totally obvious and boring. But the point is that if we label by color the neurons according to when they were active in the sequence, it turns out that there's no organization. There's no spatial organization. Yeah? You might expect that, OK, first firing ones would be here, last would be there. Nope, it's completely scattered. It doesn't look completely random to me. For example, the yellow, green cell. So it's not a random pattern. It's so random as far as we can tell statistically. Well, it depends on what we can discuss yeah. it offline. We can discuss it offline. I mean, of course, the human brain is extraordinarily good at seeing patterns. No, 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 but, but the point is detecting <laughs> spatial patterns statistically yes, yes, yes. itself. Uh, anyway, we, a simple, a simple, anyway we'll, we'll discuss it offline. OK, cool. So now, this, I think, is. Uh, and this is the basis for another collaborative thing that we're, we're just in the process of initiating. It's to think of sequence learning as a really fundamental step in a huge range of activities that we do. So what is the common theme between music, dance, speech, reading, remembering things, and even thinking? 
And it is, one of the key things is that these are all ordered events in time. Yeah? You, I won't, I won't belabor the point. It's pretty obvious, right? You do these things in a sequence. You learn these sequences. And so, and it's also well known now that sequences occur at, in the brain at all times. It occurs in the resting brain. It occurs when you're sleeping. It occurs when you are remembering something. Yeah? And so, in, in fact, one of the weird things that they occur even before you remember something. Well, I won't go into that. There's a, huge, a lovely controversy about that in the, in the field. So sequences are really fundamental, and they happen all the time. So what we're doing is putting together an initiative to study these sequences, specifically at the physiological, at the mechanistic, and at the computational levels. And this is something which we're trying to involve a lot of institutions, um, IITs, ISERs, uh, NCBS, ISC, NBRC. A lot of places have, have already got some involvement in this. And we hope that this will uh, become a, another exciting initiative. So, on the themes of collaboration, that's why I bring it up. Okay, so now let me talk about controlling activity. So that's one great thing, right? We can read out what is happening using light. It turns out you can control activity of the brain using light. So earlier approaches to controlling activity used uh, electrical things called dynamic clamps. They use uncaging of uh, compounds, basically zap it with, uh, zap the medium, laser zap so that it, it releases a neurotransmitter locally and even electrode arrays. But what we're going to discuss involves using pattern stimulation, uh, which in this case is, starts out with just a projector. It's, it shines light onto the uh, sample. So if you imagine this projector over here, instead of ex expanding light onto the big screen, were to collapse it, minify it instead of magnifying it onto a small region of brain, you could then control in space and time exactly what patterns you give, and this is what we do. So we focus it onto, the, onto a small region of the brain, in fact, the hippocampus again, and we can control the big spot, small spot, bright spot, I mean, all of these things. And this is the leash that does it. There's the projector. And there, down there is, this, is the brain slice, uh, a couple of millimeters across. And so what you do is you record from one cell very, very accurately using a patch electro, I won't go into detail. You shine light over here. You record the activity following the light. These cells are connected to those cells, so you can record when that is sending a signal. You change the intensity, size of spot, all of these things, and there's a lot of magic molecular biology behind all of this. And then you give your stimuli. And so we can give pattern random stimuli, we can give ordered stimuli, we can give sequences of stimuli. And uh, these give us the ability, for example, to compare what you get. So we're recording from this guy. This is when there's no light stimulus. And now we give the light stimulus here, and now the response to these random patterns is that this neuron is very, very active. There's a lot of input coming in, and it's responding vigorously. Um, and you can, it's, it's very, very clear, right? If you, if you open the field of view, you get lots of activity. You turn it off, it's absolutely silent. You can record from the same cells in the same region where the light was being given, you get lots of activity. Um, this is an activity map that you can create. So if you record and you scan across, you can actually build up a map of where the input's coming from, where is it most responsive to. And this is, again, a kind of uh, uh, technique for analyzing uh, connectivity, in this case, uh, functional connectivity, not just anatomical connectivity. So this is an area where the involvement of many people, many institutions, is really paramount. And there's already a lot of groups around the world who contribute to this, and I'm just throwing this list of possible things up as uh, things to think about. Let me end with uh, a brief uh, mention of simulation. So I use and I develop in my lab uh, a, a simulation system called Moose, the multi-scale object-oriented simulation environment. And Moose, the multi-scale here means that uh, we are interested in really looking at brain as it computes across many levels of organization, all the way from uh, molecules up to the level of behavior. Here's, here I'm going to be controversial. I'm going to assert, and you can come and argue with me later, that the brain does almost all its computation, not in the electrical, but in the chemical domain. Yeah? I can run through this set of calculations with you, but the, 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 the bare essence of the argument is this, that although electrical computations are fast, they are long range. So the length scale for computations is of the order of a millimeter. Molecular computations, which by the way, actually underlie action potentials, which are 
of the millisecond time range, even, even giving that up. Chemical calculations, although they may, they may be slower, they are very, very small in punctate. And so, and there are also many, many pathways. And so you end up with at least a hundredfold greater compute, compute capacity in the chemical domain than the electrical. Yeah? And I have all sorts of things I'm trying to do with this. Here's another way of looking at the same thing. This is half a micron across. This is a synaptic spine. So you saw this be the beautiful uh, EM reconstructions that, uh, uh, that Peter had, had uh, shown earlier. Well, these are the smallest features that were there in that reconstruction. And inside each single one of these features is this incredible array of computing machinery that is a whole range of signaling pathways. Yeah? And this is what is doing the ISR, the bulk of the computation in your brain. Okay, so we want to study this. Here are some of the people who do it. I will zoom past the names. Subha, Harsha, Aditya, Neeraj, uh, Aviral, and Dilawar over there, but many people have been involved in this over the years. And Moose's job is to simulate all the way from molecules to networks. We have simulations of this big network. This is Aditya's work. We have simulations of cells of different levels of detail, different kinds of cells. We have simulations of the signaling pathways inside them. Um, here, for example, is a simulation we've, we've done, which has a large network of very simple neurons, and embedded in that one very, very detailed neuron, and on that very detailed neuron, there's a whole lot of dendritic spines, and in every single one of those dendritic spines, there's a complicated signaling cascade. Yeah? This, needless to say, this involves some serious computation. Yeah? And so we have a lot of ongoing efforts. We are very keen to get involvement of people who want to do uh, computing, who want to help parallelize this and uh, optimize all of this. So there's a lot, so actually, neuroscience and computational neuroscience in particular is in, is, in a, is in an unprecedented place now. For once, we are confronted with too much data. Yeah? The data are not all in, and it's not, everything is not perfect yet, but between the kinds of optical recordings, optical stimulations, the various brain mapping efforts, the, the connectomics, the molecular biology, there's this flood of data, and to my way of thinking, the only way to make sense of it is to systematically collate it and make, not just collate it, I mean, collating is just, you know, filing things into a database, but to make functional models that allow you to make predictions and analyses and understand mechanisms. And that's really the, the effort and undertaking that uh, we're, we're interested in and are very keen to collaborate on. So the directions, there are co many collaborative opportunities that I would like to bring to your notice. Um, I've mentioned some of the research groups various kinds of uh, research that they're doing uh, and initiatives, the amazing things that are being done in neuroscience now through imaging and optogenetics and the possibilities of simulation. So, thank you.